This is the end user training. So today we'll be going over how to create a book and how to publish a book and all the parts in between. So I wanted to start with a couple of examples of how to navigate around your network. So we've chosen Rebus Press today because they are our sister organization and they have a incredible collection of books in their catalog. So as with all networks, when you come on the network page, there is this page here. And if you're a network manager, as a lot of you are, um, you will have seen how you could customize your front page. So when you slide down, a lot, of a lot of networks will have their own catalog. So in this case, I've pulled up the Rebus catalog and they have a large collection of books that you can filter through. And uh, these are all books. And as I have uh, explained probably in a network manager training, or if you haven't been to one before, uh, not only is your network a website, but each individual book is a site as well. So if we come into an example in the Rebus community um, book, this is a book site, and this is also a web book. So in this case, I have pulled up Introduction to Philosophy, Philosophy of Mind, and it's a beautiful book. There's the ability to read the book, buy the book, and download the book. And, and there's also the book information and the book cover. So this is a excellent example of a beautifully filled book. Um, and the end goal is for your book to look something like this when your book is fully populated. And I wanted to take you through the reading interface on some of these books as well. So if we go into one of the chapters, so here I chose another book. They have a book called Introduction to Community for Psychology. And this is also a very populated book. And if we go back in their chapter six, you can see that they've chosen a theme which has its specific um, typefaces and fonts. And there is a box, a learning objective box, a picture with captions and hyperlinks and glossary terms, amongst other cool features such as a YouTube video that's been embedded. Lots of neat things going on. Another good example of a populated chapter is in our integrations.pressbooks.network. This is one of our test networks. It's a demo book, but this is a great example because um, this uses Hypothesis, which is a open source annotation tool. And this helps us, uh, this is a tool that is added onto Pressbooks that you can activate for um, each individual book in your network that's accessible to everybody. And the administrator of the book has the ability to turn this feature on. So this is cool because you can annotate different um, parts of the book and it will take you directly to the annotation that you've made. And the annotation itself has a lot of features such as adding pictures and you can share the annotation, et cetera, et cetera. I will go through that with you today as well. This is an H5P activity, which is an interactive uh, plugin that we've enabled for Pressbooks EU users. That will not be covered today. This is just getting started with Pressbooks. And later in the month, we're hoping to host a um, advanced publishing session um, that Steele or I will be hosting. So this is, a, this is an example of a more complex chapter uh, as compared to this one, um, which just has the basic usages of uh, writing a book in Pressbooks. Awesome, so we can now get started with creating a book. So when I come onto my network, this is what you will see. I, I am a network admin because I work for Pressbooks. I am on every network as a network manager. If you are a network manager, you'll also see network admin, your homepage, and my books as an option. If you are an end user, you will only see this option and this option alone. And underneath it, you will see my catalog, which will take you to the books that you have in your catalog or the books that you're a part of. Uh, you can create a book and you can clone a book, and I will go through all of those as well. Um, if, you, if you're new to Pressbooks and this is your first time logging in, you will not see clone a book. And once you have a book in your catalog, you will see the feature. So don't worry if you can't see it quite yet. So if I go down, I will see create a new book and I will start there. So when I land on this page, I will see all the books that I'm a part of. As you can see, I'm a part of quite a, a, quite a few right now because I test on this network quite frequently. And one thing I would like to note with Pressbooks is that you can change almost anything. Anything, I often get a lot of questions regarding if I publish the book and make it public, will I be able to private it and add, add other stuff and publish it again? Yes, you will always be able to change any aspect of it and you'll always have a revision history that you can go back on and 
uh, replenish that version again. The one thing that cannot be changed is your webbook address. So you want to be careful when you're naming the URL of your book. So in this case, I always call it test book, which is very boring. <laughs> but for the purposes of the demo, I will call it test book. I think someone is not muted. If, they, if you could all mute yourselves, I, that'd be excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and privacy is important because if your book is unpopulated, you probably want your book to be privated. So I am going to say, nope, I don't want my book to be public. I'm going to create my book. This site already exists. <laughs> so I'm going to test book three. <laughs> and while this is loading, does anyone have any questions? I see the chat's going off a little bit. Nothing in the chat so far, Amy, that needs to be answered by you. OK, excellent. So same with before. Now I end up on my test book. Uh, you will always be able to find your books under my books and it says test book down here. So this is my book that I'm on now. And it indicates which book you're on because it shows you a fourth option in your top bar. There's a couple of things that you want to deal with right away or as you go along in publishing your book and that is users. So if you're an instructor, this is an incredibly important part of the book because you might want to add students or TAs to your book. You can either add new, depending on your settings, if you have SSO or if you don't, students will be either be able to log in on their own or you might have to add them as users to the book. So either way, this is a useful option because you can, you as the administrator have control, administrator of the book have control over who you can add into your book. So if your user is already on the network, say they're a part of another book or they've logged in and have made themselves a user for your institution's network, then you can add them as an existing user. Or if you know that they've never logged in before, um, which is likely the case if your school doesn't have SSO because um, they won't have been able to log in themselves, then you can add them as a new user. And if you want to add all of your students at the same time and don't want to click the, board, uh, click the same add new button a hundred times, then you can, add, you can bulk add users to this book and it will be one entry per line. And this is really important, this is the rule. So this allows you to choose how much control they have over the book. So an editor will allow you to make, to see the whole book and make edits throughout the entire book. There's a guide chapter in the guide um, that I linked to regarding user lists and user roles. And it tells you the amount of control they can have over a book. So that's how you add users to a book. And the next important part is getting started with your book. So book info is where all of your book information, as the title would suggest, and your metadata will be contained. So as I had said, there's nothing final with press books. This test book three cannot be changed, but the title of your book can be changed. So if I want to call it Amy's test book, the book will now be called Amy's test book. And the book title refers to this here. The short title, a lot of people, if the title um, is really long, then in the running head, the title can be shortened. So that's a useful feature. And subtitle, if you need it, a lot of people will put their version numbers in here um, because it goes underneath the book title itself. And then here you can add author, editor, translator, reviewer, et cetera, et cetera, other people who have contributed to the book. This is a little bit confusing, but this has nothing to do with the user roles that I've shown you before. So if I want to add a new contributor to this book, you can either choose from the users who had been added to the books as it was shown here, but I'm going to add Steele. So I can add him as a contributor and now he shows up, he will show up under the book info in the book itself. If I go down here, then he would show up as an author down there. And that goes, oh, I guess it didn't save, but it, that is what would effectively happen. Oh, there we go. I don't know why that doesn't show up, but um, continuing on, publisher, publisher city, all of this information can be populated. If you wish, you can leave a blank. And like I said, you can always come back at any point in your book process, even after your book has been completed. The nice part about press books, as I mentioned, is that nothing is ever final, and that includes the book completion. There is no hard copy to prove the book's completion. You can always edit as you go along. The ISBN information is useful if you want to publish your book and print uh, and sell a print version of it. 
And the language is here. We have an incredible amount of languages. If there isn't a language to your liking that you want, you can always put it as a, put it in as a feature request um, at premium, uh, and send us an email. But this will effectively change all the metadata meta in your book, sorry, all the uh, book information um, titles. And this will change into the language of your choice as you put on here. Cover image, this is where your book cover goes, um, like the image there. Subjects, subjects are cool because if you ever have a catalog, then this is where the subject comes in handy because it, you're, you'll be able to filter according to the subject. Um, I know a lot of you are librarians. This is the part that gets librarians excited because we have, man, my computer doesn't like the screen share and record at the same time. <laughs> um, down here, you're able to choose between a, a variety of licenses. All of those are available to you. And then the about the book. Sorry, Steele. Amy, would you just pause for a second and take us back up to the licenses? So there have been a lot of questions in the chat about what it means to have a public book, a private book, what happens if a book is public, who it's visible to, et cetera. And then someone was saying, if I wanted to make an OER, what would I need to do? And so OER, Many people are familiar with it, but it's an acronym that means Open Educational Resource. So if I wanted to make a book that was visible to anyone without having to log into Pressbooks, what would I need to do? Um, I will show you that in a second. So copyright and the book being public or private are completely separate. So the copyright refers to the the legalities of the book itself. So if it's all rights reserved, then you wouldn't be able to clone the book because the book is reserved to that author. Whereas making the book public or private is a different case. So public and private are is an accessible is is an accessibility thing that we have implemented that exists on our organized. So the organized module is where you would come to write the book. So currently this book is private, which means that if I were to log out, let's go visit the book. If I were to log out, I am no longer, I'm barred out of the book now because the book had been set to private. So only the users of this book would have access to this book. And now if I sign back in, I have the access to the book because I am my own user. Conversely, if I added Steel as a user to this book, Steel would also have access to this book. Whereas if we take, for example, this Rebus community book. I'm not signed into Rebus community, but I'm able to see this book, which means that it is public. And a question that we get very frequently, as I had mentioned, is um, whether I'm able to switch back and forth between the two. Yes, absolutely. I'm able to switch back and forth whenever I want. It's as simple as clicking the button. I hope that answers everyone's questions. Steele, is there anything else in the chat that- uh... Oh, Amy, there's so much in the chat, but for right now, I think <laughs> that was pretty much what you wanted to show. I think showing the difference between a public book and a private book and what's visible. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later, I think, about how you can make individual content within a book, public or private, because you yeah. can get really granular, and that's true of licenses as well. But yeah. for now, I think that's probably good. I think that answered the questions that I was seeing. Let me just go back through and read through some of the chat questions. Um, Debbie and Sarah um, and Xiao Jing, I think those are the questions that I saw from each of you. Um, if you had a follow-up question that you wanted to ask, um, Debbie, that's a, Debbie asked, if we're still working on a book and developing it, should we begin with public anyway? Um, that That is really up to you because so, there, the, the visibility of a book is really dependent on how visible you want the book to really be. Because even if you set it to public, the chances of someone finding that book without being on the network is pretty slim. So it depends on how you want to go about it. So for example, oh man, there's so much, there's so much to press books that I, I'll show you later because you can also keep the book public, but if you have chapters in progress, you can choose to withhold them from the web. So you, you can choose to, so this whole book could be public right now. And even though this whole book is public, so the, writer, the author of this book may have chosen to keep a specific chapter privated. So it really depends on, there's a lot of different ways that this could happen. And, it's, and like I said, even if the book is in progress and you have an incomplete chapter and your book is public, 
if your book isn't in your catalog or um, an instructor is writing the book, but they haven't shared the link to their students, the chances of them finding it is quite low. So it depends. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can publicize and privatize your book and the specific chapters themselves. Um, there's also a way that you can set passwords to the um, specific chapters themselves. So if you want students working in collaborative groups, but you don't want one group looking at another student's book, uh, another student, uh, another group of students' chapters, then you can also set passwords as well. So there's a couple of different ways that you can, there's actually, there's a lot of different ways <laughs> that you can go back and forth between. Um, uh, there's chapter level, book level, institutional level privatization of the book that you can manage. Um, and as we go along in the session, I will show you how that's possible. And at the end, if you have any more questions, we can clarify that. I hope that's okay for now. Steele, what do you think? <laughs> I think that's great, Amy. Um, okay. I think let's proceed and go ahead and show the next things you were gonna show. And then there'll probably be follow-up questions in the chat and, and later, but so far so good. Okay, excellent. So this is how, so I'm going to end the book info section by just showing you that you can also add the tagline, the short description and long description. Um, with any book, you have the tagline, and the short description down here. And when you go down to the bottom of the book, sometimes people choose to add a very long description, as you can see here. So those are the uh, non-fun parts of the book. But right now, I'm going to show you the different methods of making a book and why Pressbooks EDU supports OER initiatives. Because at the end of the day, we're here to show you why this investment that you've made into Pressbooks is a good one. And I really like to, I, I'm, a very, um, I'm a very organized person and I like to explain the different methods of making a book. I like to break it down into three parts. So there's the bottom up method and that is creating a book from scratch. So as I've shown you just now, I went and created a book and my book is completely empty. As I've said, there's a module called organize and this is where you would come to write, write a book. So you can add front matter, add chapter, add back matter, et cetera, et cetera. There is the 5R version, so OER uh, promotes 5Rs, which is retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, which means that you're able to bring in different components from different open source texts and combine them in your book so that you have a text for, that can be catered to the students that you're catering to, or you can make a book in the way that you want to make it by acquiring resources from different acquiring um, chapters or text from different resources. And then there's what I like to call the top-down method, which is, let's say, if you really like a book and you want it on your own network, or you really like a book, or there, but there's some things that you don't like, then we have this option called cloning. And it's like one of my favorite things because you can get a entire textbook from an open source uh, resource, uh, sorry, o OER, <laughs> um, that you can that our Pressbooks API pulls every part of and you can have it on your network. And this is great because all three of these methods allow you to have creative flexibility over what's in your book. You can, um, as I had said, uh, bring in different, you can use, you can mix and match different parts of resources that you've really enjoyed using or that you find helpful. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's wonderful because you can have your own custom textbook and the return for, and it saves students thousands and thousands of dollars because you're able to build, the, build your textbook according to the way that you want to build it. And I think that's great. Um, so I will go through each of those three right now. So as I've shown you, the bottom up method, this is how you get started. You would go to my books and create a, create a new book. And as, as, as a couple of you are asking, so for example, right now in my book, in my test book, if I visit my book, I have the introduction, chapter, and appendix. But as you can see in my organize, I've shown them in web. So let's say I don't want to show this chapter right now. Even if, even though my book, and let's say I said it's a public, now when I log out, I can still see this book. But as you can see, I've hid chapter one from the public, from the web version. And therefore, it doesn't matter because even though this book is entirely public, if my chapter one is in progress, it won't show on my web book as public. So I'm going to now sign back in. But I am now me. So I have full jurisdiction over what goes in my book. So for example, I'm going to add a chapter. I'm going to say chapter two. 
and now say I wanted to add a password because I only want this accessible to a couple of people. I'm going to require a password. And now anytime anyone goes in this book, you can see that this chapter has a password, but I am locked as myself. So if I were to share this chapter, say I send this, say that Steele is a user on this book, I can tell him that the password is one, two, three, four, five, and he'd be able to now access this chapter as well. So that's, so those are a little bit of the functionalities of how you would go back and forth between different chapters and populate them to your liking. And now I can also add a part and let's call this middle body for a lack of a more creative name. And this will create different parts in the book as well. So the nice part is you don't ever have to decide the order before you do something because you're able to move different parts throughout the book and it will relocate the relocate it immediately. So now if you go visit the book, then you can see that it's been set up the way that I, I reorganized. The one thing that I need to note is that you can't go back and, so the book is really separated into three parts, the front matter, the, the middle matter, where all the chapters are, and the back matter. You can't switch between, you can't go back and forth between the two. So for example, I can't drag appendix up here. So those are, that is how you would get started with organizing a book. And then there is, as I said, the five R version. So those are the five R's of OER. And this is, and the way that you would really do this is by going down to tools and going to import. So not only do I have the parts that I've written myself, I can now bring in different parts from different books. So here I have a couple of books that I want to show you. This is also a Rebus book, Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks so far. I'm sure this also has, all of these textbooks have incredible information in the field that they are promoting. So I wanted to bring in this book. This is an open, open faculty patch book that's on our pressbooks.com network. This is also a great book that was written by Fulman College faculty. And then our, one of our open source derivatives called Open Text BC um, have this excellent English book. So, Using those three examples, I will be bringing in different content. So I've already downloaded, these are the formats that are available to bring in to import. Um, a question that we get frequently is, are we able to import PDF? And the answer is no, unfortunately, we cannot bring in PDF. So that's something to keep in mind. So in this case, I wanted to bring in the XML. And earlier I had downloaded a, uh, the Rebus guide as an XML by using their download this book function here. I'll also show you how you can add that on to your book at the end of the session. And now when I begin import, the nice part of the import, import is that you can choose what you can bring in. So let's say I just wanna bring in um, licensing information and I want to make that a chapter. When I import the selection, you will see that the book has been, uh, this chapter has been brought into the part that I wanted. I wanted it as a chapter and it's been brought in as a chapter. And I want this to show in the book itself. So I'm going to see show in web. So now this is in my book. So now I'm going to go back to import. And let's say that I want to bring in this book, but from, but this book doesn't have a download function available. So I'm going to go down to, oops to the URL and click import from URL and big an import. Same thing as before. So I'm going to say the shift keys and import selection. So with all of these import options, no matter the method or no matter the, uh, the, type, uh, the type of file, the format of the file, you'll be, you'll, you'll be given this option. And as you can see, it brought this information in as well and with the author name. So that's a, that's a very simple example of bringing in um, different resources from uh, bringing in different chapters from different resources and reorganizing it in my book as I wish to. And now I go into my textbook, test book, not my textbook. <laughs> you will see that all the chapters that I brought in are there as well. And then the last thing that I wanted to show you as I'd shown you is my favorite part, the cloning. <laughs> And the cloning a book is really useful because lots of instructors will see books they like from a different network and they'll want to bring it in. 
And the nice part about cloning that is different than bringing in an entire book from the import function is that it will clone over everything perfectly. So that includes H5P activities, all of the media, all of the metadata, everything that you could possibly think of. It is exactly like having that book on that network, but except now in your network. The only thing with cloning is that you can only bring in bring it in from a Pressbooks network, as it should, because it is our it because. It can, it is, oh, it's limited to the bounds of the Pressbooks universe. So in this case, as I had said, even though OpenText BC is not necessarily, they are not a Pressbooks EDU network, they're open source and they um, are a derivative of the Pressbooks network. So I will be able to clone this. And so, similarly, a question that we get a lot as, as well is, uh, can you clone from Lumen, Lumen Learning? And yes, you can. So I'm going to put this as a source book URL, and then I will say open text BC. So this takes the longest because as I said, our API is pulling in every piece of information that, the, that this book has. And once this comes into our network, you'll see that every part of this book looks identical except for the, the heading. <laughs> and it's because we're on a different network. Um, and this will take some, oh, I don't know why that's not working, but this, I think uh, perhaps the, uh, this book has changed. So I will take instead from the faculty patch textbook. This should work a little bit better. Okay, uh, because this is going to take a little bit, is there any question? are there any questions that I should address still? Whew, I'm, I'm kind of tired just from the chat. It's been fun. So a bunch of people were asking questions about import, Amy. Yeah. Um, so asking about specifically importing different books from different file types. I think I tried to answer those. You covered the different file types that people can import from. Are you planning to show an example of an import or two later? An import or two? Um, yes, absolutely. Okay. So we'll, it, we'll show those examples for how to import files uh, in a second. Yeah. Got um, yeah, there's just a bunch of pretty advanced questions from all kinds of interesting people in the chat. Uh, I'm trying to answer them in the chat. Um, but maybe we'll take one or two of them in the in the um, in the video. Someone was asking specifically about XML imports. Um, yeah, and we can show that one. Uh, there was a question about H5P cloning, whether that was a new thing. I think Mallory asked that. That we've been supporting H5P cloning for probably close to a year now. I'll try to find the exact reference and put it in the chat for that. Um, and Sarah asked, what is the best way to uh, incorporate a OpenStax textbook? So we've been having a little bit of trouble with OpenStax because it seems like the, uh, the method for downloading their, um, uh, it's just, we can't clone from OpenStax because they're not a Pressbooks network. So we've been getting a lot of questions because there's a lot of great resources on there. And oftentimes with OpenStax, they will have um, a zip file with individual XML files. And it's a bit of a pain. And we're trying to maybe find a better solution for this. But right now, the best way to import um, from OpenStax networks is to look at uh, the download options they have made available and download the zip file because they contain the XML files for each individual chapter inside of it. And I'll add, for the actual OpenStax textbooks, a number of Pressbooks users have already imported and cleaned them up into their Pressbooks networks and made them open. So sometimes it's a question of just searching the OpenStax title and adding the word Pressbooks to your search entry. And you can usually find a Pressbooks network where it exists. BC Campus in particular has brought in, I think, like 30 of the OpenStax titles. And so their Pressbooks network often has many of them. If it's a specific title you're looking for, you can send us an email and we'll try to point you to where it might exist in Pressbooks. Once somebody's already brought in and cleaned up, you can just use the cloning routine that Amy mentioned. It will take a while, but it usually will bring the book in for you. And that's a big time saver. So thanks to BC Campus and others who've been bringing those into Pressbooks and cleaning them up. Um, and to answer the import question, um, as long as your import matches, so when you choose the file, your, the file type that you choose has to match the import type that you're selecting. So if I wanted to bring in an XML, and I go into the Rebus guide and they've made the XML version available, all I'd have to do is download that, make sure that the XML is chosen and choose the correct file type. And it will, it will begin the import for you automatically. But the important thing to note here is that you are, you are limited to the file type that you're able to choose from when you're importing and the max file type itself. But 
um, it's, I think it's pretty rare that books are over 25 megabytes for a standard textbook. Uh, many have over that, but it's important to note that there. So now I will show you my cloned book. So now that I've cloned over my book, under my books, I will see this brand new book. And as you can see, and when I go visit the book, it looks identical to the book that I had cloned over from, except I'm on the university network that, that we have as a testing network. So it looks a little bit different, but every, the book itself looks identical. And at the bottom, it will say that the book, it will say book source and where the book is cloned from. And it says it may look, it differ, differ, it may differ from the original um, because as an OER, you're, you have the ability to remix and revise and update this book to your liking. And this book has been made that way. As I mentioned earlier with copyright, it's important to note the copyright itself because if it's an all rights reserved book, you won't be able to clone the book. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, um, now that I've gone through all of those different methods, something that I wanted to mention, something that I wanted to go through is the, is populating the book. So right now my chapters are completely empty and I've told you how you can structure the book together, but didn't really explain all the parts of uh, making the book pretty. <laughs> so I will go through that now. So there's a couple of parts to note on this page that are important. Um, you can add media through this button here and I'll go through that in a little bit. This is the visual editor and the part is up here. So if you didn't wanna drag like you did earlier using the organize, as I've shown, you can drag through different parts uh, within the same bodies in the book. So the front matter, the middle matter, and the back matter, you're able to change them up. So in this case, if I wanted to ch change this to middle body, I'm able to do so. Uh, same with the organized page here. I can choose to select or unselect the status and visibility of the book itself and revisions as well. So I will go into that a little bit later and show you what it looks like when I uh, want to go back to an earlier revision. But the most important part to actually writing in the book itself is the visual and text editor. So the visual editor is easy because it looks basically like all the icons and um, each of the buttons are, self, are pretty uh, self-explanatory or intuitive. Um, they look similar to that of Google Docs or Word. So this is bold, italicized, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of functions that are cool is that there's a special character for accessibility reasons. If you want to use this instead of your keyboard, um, you can create an anchor. There's, uh, you can add in pieces of code if you'd like. Um, there's footnote and there's glossary terms. So if I wanted to add a footnote, um, I just have to drop my cursor. And I don't think you can see this because it's on my browser. But if I want to add a footnote here, I can say, uh, this is a footnote. And now you can see that there's a short code denoting the fact that this is a footnote. And if I want to create a glossary term, I can click this and I can, the description can be um, a piece of writing. <laughs> and I can insert. And you can see there's also a short code for the glossary as well. Um, the text editor is useful because if you know HTML and you prefer writing in HTML for some reason or another, then you're able to do this on here. Um, I'm not going to go too into it. I, when we have the advanced um, publishing session with Pressbooks, I will explain, uh, Steeler, I will explain why uh, using the text editor might be more useful. But for the purposes of this session alone, the visual editor is incredibly useful. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to go through is are the headings. So for accessibility reasons and otherwise, it's important that when you're creating your textbook to use the heading sequentially. So if you use heading one, then go to heading two next, heading three, heading four. And this will make your book, if someone were to export your book or to use it in somewhere else or for your purposes as well, um, it's nice because it will make your life a little bit easier if you were to have the headings um, in a sequential manner, use them in a sequential manner. So let's just say heading one, this is a heading. And in fact, I'm going to put this under here. So it looks a little bit nicer. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you is are tables and text boxes. So you, you are able to create tables in here. 
and you can tell that they're cells. And if you go here and click on table properties, you're able to decide um, the lines and the grids and um, the alignment that you want for your text boxes, sorry, for your tables. And then another useful thing that a lot of people use are the text boxes. So there's examples and learning objectives. They're essentially the same um, with different colors and you're able to change the colors and I'll show you um, how that's done in a little bit. But these are useful because a lot of instructors will add in examples or pictures or H5P activities in here so that it looks, it stands out from the regular text in the background. So in this way, it's very, very useful and similar to what you would find in a paper textbook, except you, you're always at the capacity to change them to your liking. And a lot of people have asked us how we would be able to use this in a uh, STEM setting. I actually studied chemistry in university and boy, would it have not been nice to have a free textbook instead of spending a lot of money on all of those textbooks. And it's very easy to add in math. Um, you just have to use the LaTeX short code. So in this case, I'm going to write in a very simple Pythagorean theorem equation. and you just need LaTeX and the uh, LaTeX with a backslash at the end to denote the end of the code itself. And the last thing that I wanted to show you here is as I had mentioned earlier, adding media. So you always have the ability to add media up here and I am going to upload. And I was eating strawberries earlier this morning and I wanted to add in a picture of strawberries. <laughs> And I got this picture from a, the CC Search Creative Commons.org page. And, oops. And the uh, creator wanted to be credited. So I am able to add in the, their attributions down here, the author, their author URL, and the source URL. For the sake of time, I'm not going to add it in because this book is going absolutely nowhere. Um, but you're able to do that there. And there's also alt text there as well for um, accessibility purposes as well, because the whole point of OER is that it's supposed to be accessible. So the alt text will show up in the case that the picture doesn't render for whatever reason. So I'm going to add that in. And if I want to add a caption, I can say, oh. And I can say, ripe strawberry. <laughs> awesome. So now the caption goes underneath as well. And if you wanted to use a YouTube video, um, this YouTube is a part of uh, OEmbeds, which can be automatically embedded just by taking the title, sorry, taking the URL and inserting them into the chapter with no other effort, it will automatically render. So that's a really useful feature as well. And the nice part about these, as I had mentioned earlier, is that they're able to be put into text boxes if you don't want them just floating around in the middle of your text. Okay, so now I'm going to save. And I'm going to go view my chapter. And as you can see, everything rendered the way that it was supposed to. So my table doesn't look great right now because I didn't populate it, but as you can see, the footnote is there and you can go back and forth by clicking on the button. My glossary term is there as well, and whatever I put in will show up right underneath the text. My image with the caption, as I said, if this image didn't render, then you would get, an, you would get the alt text. The video will play right as I um, click on the video because it's, rendered well, it's, because it's rendered well. The example text boxes, and the last part, the math equation. So MathJax, the tool that we use for rendering our equation, um, has rendered this Pythagorean theorem perfectly. And the nice part is it will render, it renders into an image. And once you click, if you right hand click, yes, right hand click on this, then you can see with accessibility tools and settings, you can trigger zoom and you can also, there's zoom factors. So it allows you, it allows, there's a bunch of different ways that math is accessible. And it makes it so that we, you can have any sort of text, text that you wish to. Sorry, I'm getting to the point in the demo where I've been talking so much that I'm stuttering. <laughs> um, and that's it. So now when we go back into the admin of this book and go back to the Amy, can I can I ask you to um, take a couple of questions that people had specifically about contributors? So yes. you mentioned, is that something you're planning to cover later or should we? I think we can address it now. Okay, so someone people were asking, 
what's the difference between a user and a contributor? Why would you create a contributor? And like, how do you do it? How do you give credit? Especially, how do you give credit to someone if you're using an open text that you've remixed? How do you use the contributor tool to give them credit? So using the, um, when you, I'm actually not, still when you clone a book, do they, auto, do they automatically bring in, bring in the authors as the contributors into the cloned book? Yes, the metadata for the contributors and metadata should come in when you clone a book. But let's say, but in some cases, you might have imported something from another source that wasn't Pressbooks, yeah. and you'll have to manually produce the contributor info. I right. So they're asking you about. Yeah. So for the whole book, you'd be able to do it here, as I'd shown you earlier. And let's say I brought this, I brought a book in from Open Text BC, but they they're not a user on my book, right? Because they, why would I, why would I add them in as a user into my book when I've brought their content in? So you just come into the book info and you'd go down here and create a new contributor. And as I had said, um, anyone from this book can now, you can add them as a user or you can just add them in themselves. So if, actually a common question we get is what if you want to cr make creative commons your contributor? Like, is, it, is that a possibility or do they have to be a real person? And the answer is no, because we've made the book info, all of these add new contributor, add new editor, add new author. We've made it so that you can add in whoever you want um, without them having to be necessarily a real person or a user on your book. So I can put in Creative Commons, add new contributor. And now when I go into visit my book and oops, Steele, do you know why that's not showing? Sorry, what's not showing? I added the uh, contributor as Creative Commons on here. And it's not showing up in my book. Huh. I think we ran into some kind of error there. Yes, sure. we have run into some sort of an error, but technically it should show up. <laughs> Well, you need to, so you've added this as a contributor, but then in book info, sorry, go back to book info. Oh, they're yeah. available to be listed, but you have to list them in one of those roles. Sorry, that's why we needed to do. Yeah, there we go. So now, sorry, that, that button was just to create a new contributor and now I can add Creative Commons. See, sometimes it's so complicated, even I don't know. <laughs> so now when we visit the book. Excellent. So now as a contributor, Creative Commons is under there. Does that answer someone's question? Or yeah, Amy, would you just go a bit slower on this page? So if you look at general book information here, yeah. these are the different fields that you can give people credit for. So there's an author field and the author field is the one that displays at the top of the book info or at the top of the book homepage. There's an editor field that can have multiple contributors. So would you show me how I could add say two editors to this book? Yeah, so as long as you add, as long as they're under the contributor list, you are able to add. So let's say we want to add Zoe, our friend. Oh, at Rebus. And uh, editor. Oh my goodness, there we go. We want to add our friends at Perva and Zoe. Then we'd be able to do so. And then we just have to click save. But the important thing to note here is that they are made as a contributor. They can't just be a user in the book. They have to be made specifically as a contributor under book info. Okay. And then that person could be credited for any one of those roles or all of those roles. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I hope that answered the questions. I know there's a bunch of questions about contributors and how you use them. Hopefully that answers the questions that people are asking in the chat. Um, thanks for taking the detour, Amy. Yeah, of course. Um, the last couple of things that I wanted to show you it are the subsets of what I've just shown you in my test book underneath um, chapter one. So as I'd shown you, I had used um, math here and the picture. So those two things are important to mention because in your you have this uh, media selection in the right hand side and this is where your media library is. So you can either choose to populate your media library first and then put it into your book, or you can add the images, you can upload the images directly into your chapters and they will automatically show up in the media library. So they go both ways. So it just depends on what you want to do. So in this case, because I already uploaded and I uploaded the strawberry image directly from the chapter, as you can see, it shows up in the media library. 
and you can, and there's also a separate button to add new or add new up here. And the last thing that I want to show you that's important is MathJax because MathJax is the tool which renders our math equations for us by default. So you're able to, if you see this image up here, it means that MathJax is working and that the, um, and that this image that you see in your chapter, any math equations that you see should automatically render themselves as well. And you're able to see, as you can see, I use this uh, notation with um, square bracket LaTeX and then square bracket with uh, back, uh, backward slash LaTeX, but you're able to also use different, uh, uh, sorry, um, tags as well to add in your equations. And let's say I am super unhappy. Can someone mute themselves? I'm still hearing a lot of background noise. Thank you. Um, on the edit page, um, on the revisions, if I go to browse, Apparently it doesn't like my computer very much. <laughs> okay, I think this network is tested on quite a bit. So I think that might be an issue on our end. But if you were to do this on your network, then you should be able to see browse. And once you click on it, you will have the option to go back and forth between previous versions and they'll show side by side and you're always able to restore a previous version that you've saved. So if you're someone who likes to be able to go back on your mistakes a lot or go back on something that you've done, I would recommend saving a lot because as you're saving, it will show up as a new revision every time. Okay, so that is how you populate the individual chapters within the book. So now I've shown you how to create the book, how to structure the book and how to populate the book. So now let's make our book pretty or let's design the book the, the, the way that we want to. So this is what you would, uh, so where you would come to is appearance. And there's three core uh, features of appearance that are important. So first of all is themes. By default, unless you've managed this for your setting, uh, sorry, unless you've changed this for your specific network, by default, most books will be McLuhan. Um, because when we set up networks, we set the default of each book to be McLuhan. And this is our core theme. So all other 21 themes are uh, built off of McLuhan, as we like to call it, the child of McLuhan. But there's 21 themes that are available to you. And as you can see, there's different, you can see the typefaces when just upon coming onto this page. If you want to see the specifics of each theme, then you would have to activate. But as I've said, you can always change the theme whenever you want to. And the nice part is it won't change anything in your book. Um, it won't remove any content. It will just change the colors and um, the, the fonts, et cetera, et cetera. The text boxes may look different, but if you're not happy with it, you can always change back and nothing will have changed. Everything will look the way that you, you had expected it to look. Um, I wanted to go through a couple of the commonly used themes. McLuhan is used very commonly. For textbooks, especially, Andreasen is used quite a bit. Um, same with down here, Graham, Jacobs, and Malala. So Malala is our newest theme, and um, uh, it looks very pretty in my opinion. It looks very modern, and it is the only theme by default with a little bit of color in the text. It's this beautiful dark blue. And it's cool because all the themes are named after authors. Theme options is where you can come to make specific changes. Um, so depending on a theme that you've chosen, so let's say we go up here and I want to change to Malala if I activate this. Now when I go to theme options, I will see that it's, it, it's, a, it's the changes that I'm making to the Malala theme for my specific book. So you can, you have these global options to whether or not display your parts and chapters. There's a lot of things that you can explore down here. And if your book is written in a different language, there's language and script support. So if you have, if you're using a non-Arabic language, if you decide to choose from here, then um, this feature will adequately support um, the non-Latin language you're using so that it, they, so that all of the text renders properly. And as I would said, you can change the text box colors down here the way that you like. And then you have some different options for web, for PDF and for ebook, because those are the options that we have in exporting your book. And then we have custom styles. So 
if you are good at CSS, then you have the option, you can see the core CSS that's been written by us. And if you want to change them, you can put them down here. So if you want to make your glossary terms smaller, then you're able to put the, uh, you're able to change this. All, you just have to make sure that your classes are targeted properly. And you also have to make those changes differently for ebook, e uh, sorry, web, ebook, and PDF. So those are the stylistic changes that you can make. And as I had said, they're always under appearance. The, now we're nearing the end, so I can take a bit of a breather. Um, as I had shown you earlier, I'm actually going to go on to here and try to close the rest of these because it's very cluttered. So I wanted to show you hypothesis really briefly because um, a lot of instructors like to use this for a variety of different reasons because Pressbooks as um, honor in creating the book, we get a lot of questions as to whether or not you can make comments referring to specific text or make edits to the book. And the answer is no, it doesn't serve like a Google doc or a word file, but um, hypothesis serves so useful because you're able to highlight text and write notes on it directly, which makes it incredibly useful when you're trying to target specific text. And it's also useful if you're having, if as an assignment tool, because if you are an instructor and you want students to write um, blog post or um, a short paragraph or even an essay about um, the book and refer to it, then you are able to uh, make them do so on Hypothesis. So I'll show you how that works really quickly. So under settings right above Math Jacks for your book, you will see Hypothesis. And once you click on it, um, you will have the settings. So um, for each book, you'll have to turn on Hypothesis separately. So right now it's turned off because I don't have it turned on for anything. So I want to allow it for chapters. And I don't want the sidebar open by default. And yes, I would like the hi highlights all by default, but it will make a difference right now because my book is not there's no highlights yet. So now when I save and go into my test book, as you can see, I'm on the front page of my book, but now if I go onto a chapter, you will see that Hypothesis is enabled on the right hand side. So if you went on a back matter or front matter, you wouldn't see this because I've only enabled hypothesis for a chapter. So by clicking this little arrow here, you can choose to open or close. And this is very easy to use. The one thing to note is that you must be logged into hypothesis and you cannot log in using your Pressbooks um, network ID. And when I first heard this, I was like, How? why? Like that makes it so inconvenient. But, the, but actually that is the beauty of hypothesis because it is an open source annotation tool that can be used in wherever it is implemented. So having a specific hypothesis login ID and password will allow you to make annotations anywhere where hypothesis has been enabled outside of Pressbooks. Um, so it's really easy to get started once you're logged in. So I'm logged in as myself right now. All I'd have to do is highlight and click annotate. And it will automatically highlight the text for me and I can say this as an example. And I have the option to post it to only me, which means that I would have to be logged in as amy.pb to see it or logged in as, or um, if I put it as public, now anyone can see this. As long as this chapter is public, I would be able to see this, anyone would be able to see this annotation. And the nice part is once you click on it, it will directly open and take you there. So Hypothesis is really useful because it also supports Markdown and you can add in math equations into here if you'd like as well, the same way. Um, you can add in images if you'd like, links. You can also add in a quote and it makes it really useful because you're able to annotate. You have so much flexibility in your annotation and you can add tags to filter as well. The nice part is if you wanted to share this, uh, if you wanted to share this annotation now, all you'd have to do is click this button and I can share this with anyone that I want. So if I'm a student and um, I'm looking for annotations that are useful and studying for a test, and if I were to send this to my friend, it would take them directly onto this page, open this annotation, uh, open hypothesis and show them exactly where this annotation is and what the annotation says. Something that also might be useful for instructors is to create a new private group. I can say test group two. 
And if I create this book, now anyone with this link will be added to my group. So if you want to create, if you're an instructor and you want to create different groups for specific sets of students, then you can have different groups going so that they would be able to, uh, they would be able to annotate um, without necessarily overcrowding the page with too many annotations. So that's really useful. And the last important thing to note here is once you click on this little page button, you can create notes for the page so you don't have to annotate anything in particular, but this is useful if you want to make general announcements or make general comments about the page. So that is how you use Hypothesis. I like to do this in the intro session but because it ties in really well into using um, Hypothesis, uh, sorry, it ties in really well into using an open textbook as a interactive learning tool that students also can write in. Um, and the last, last thing that I want to show you is exports. So this book is visible on the web, but let's say you want to make this book available as a PDF or an ebook so that anyone is able to read them without internet or just for whatever reason. So now when I go into the admin page, sorry, see, I know the chat's popping off, but I am almost done. <laughs> on the export module. Everything's good, keep going. Okay, excellent. So um, on the uh, export page, you will see your theme so that you're exporting in the way that you want to. And these are the supported formats and the other formats. Um, you can use them to your liking wherever. And I'm going to say I want to export this as these two, XML, and yeah, that's it. So depending on how big your book is, that determines how long it takes to export. But these are the exports that I have available to me. But as you can see on my book, I still don't have the ability to download. And it's because I haven't made that available yet. By exporting, you're only making these exports available to yourself. So now I can download the PDF, uh, email it to my students, email it to whoever is necessary, whoever wants the book. But if I want the book to be available, to be downloaded as this book had and many other books had, then all I would have to do is go into settings, go to sharing and privacy, and turn this on. And now when I click refresh, the, the uh, versions that I exported are now available for download. So there's no specific way to make the specific versions downloadable. It's just you have to, whatever is on your export here will immediately be shown here as long as you've enabled show the download function. So let's say I don't want XML to show anymore. I want to keep the XML to myself. I just have to delete this. And once I've deleted it, the XML version is now gone. So that's it. That is the entire session. Um, I know it was long and now we can take questions in the chat.